Hey, my beautiful listeners, we are back with Season 3 of The Beautiful Side of Grief, and I'm your host, Helen Morris. My incredible guests continue to share their own personal stories of grief in so many different forms, and how they have managed to find the positives and beauty from their experiences. And I hope by listening to these honest, heartfelt accounts, you can find the tips, insights, resources, and strategies you need for where you are right here and now. And maybe one day even find your own beautiful side to your grief. So share away as I would love this podcast to reach as many who need to hear it as possible. And don't forget to check out the episode notes as well for more information and links. Plus, the energy healing I do that changed my life forever. And this season, I'd love to share the affirmations and meditations I'm working on also, so stay tuned for those. Right now though, my thanks to you for listening in, and let's check out who this week's guest is. I want you to pause for a moment and think of all the family you're surrounded by, mom, dad, sisters, brothers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and it doesn't matter if they're near or far. Now, what if you lost them all within a short space of time? How do you think you would feel or even begin to cope with that? Well, this is what happened to my guest today, Jesse Listow, a.k.a. Good Grief Jesse. In the space of six years, from the tender age of 19 through to 25, that became Jesse's story and her grief. She lost her entire immediate family, and it didn't stop there. There's the anxiety, depression, PTSD that went with that. This is Jesse's life. Though this beautiful and courageous lady recognized there was a purpose for her amidst all this grief, to create a podcast called Good Grief Jessie, where she shares her struggles, triumphs and failures while dealing with the loss of her family, and to raise the awareness that our young ones need a voice in expressing their grief. The intention I'm setting for this episode today is that we gain an understanding of what our younger generation need in dealing with their grief and to appreciate what we have. And when we hear from someone who has lost their entire family, is there something we can be doing differently around our own situation to help us deal with it in a more positive life? And with that comes a ton of love, hope and happiness your way to help you where you are right this moment. So. Jesse, I am absolutely excited to have you with me today. Thank you for joining me. Oh, that was such a beautiful intro. I, I'm trying not to cry over here, but you, <laughs> you know, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to start the conversation with you. It's going to be great. <laughs> and I'm glad we could actually connect at a more respectable hour because I'm just going to share with the <laughs> listeners that I was starting to do all the all the research around this like I do. And then I looked at the time and it was 11 p.m. I went, no (laughs) way, I'm sure we can do better than that. So (laughs) I appreciate that you were prepared to come on at that time, but I'm much, much happier that we're we're doing this at 6 p.m. your time. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I'm a a late person, so I was like, 11 p.m.? Sold. (laughs) I'll do it. (laughs) Okay, I can do this. (laughs) Yes. So up until 19, you hadn't really experienced much in the way of grief. And then one after another, you started losing all the key members of your family. First your dad, then your brother, then I believe your uncle, grandma, and then lastly your mum. And I'm going to start this show differently. I want to start with you sharing a precious memory you have about each of them, whatever comes to mind. So let's start with your dad. Oh, my dad was a charming, funny guy. He was, when I look at pictures of him, he's always doing something really goofy. And one of my favorite characteristics of myself is my sense of humor. And I know for a fact, I get that from my father. And one of my favorite memories, (laughs) one of my favorite memories from him is he was a hunter. He loved doing it. And he 
me, he took me hunting with him one time and he was telling me of how to read, you know, tracks in the dirt and, you know, scuffs on the tree for deers and stuff like that. And he, <laughs> and this is so, I'm so glad you asked this because this is just making my heart so whole talking about this. But he Great. pointed to, some deer droppings and was like, okay, you know, this is, this is a good sign. That means that they're here. They're, they're comfortable here. And he picks one up and eats it. And <gasps> I'm like, oh my gosh, as a kid. And, you know, and then he pulls a pack of milk duds out of his pocket and he's like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny to me. Cause I was like, I cannot believe that I just thought he ate deer droppings <laughs> right in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> But he that's the kind of guy he was. He was very funny. And he, you know, he had already planned this out. <laughs> like he had gone to this place, poured some milk duds on the ground and then waited for the perfect time to bring me out there to actually sell the whole experience. It was so great. I I hold that so dear to my heart. And <laughs> it's just it's just how oh, he I was. I just love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And do you know what I love about it most is that your whole demeanor changed, just remembering your dad in that moment. And that is so beautiful. You know, memories are precious. What about your brother? Oh, my brother was such a fun loving guy. He always had this really goofy laugh. And mm -hmm. one of the things that me and my brother connected on was music. We loved music. And there was this one time, and it was when uh, Snapchat and uh, Facebook, all of those social media apps started really blowing up for us. So we were at a show listening to some music, and I was recording instead of taking a picture because that was like the big thing to do back then. And when I told him, I was like, it's a video. He started laughing and it was this hilarious, goofy laugh. And then I have on my phone forever. And it's one of my favorite memories because he just was, he thought that was so funny that I was recording instead of taking a picture. And it's just something that I can always revisit whenever I want to hear that goofy laugh that he had. <laughs> Do you know, my sister... My daughter had just uh, turned 18 when she was away at Outward Bound, which was this big adventure camp. And uh, so we celebrated her 18th birthday when she got back just with family. We went out. She was legally able to have a few drinks, which she did. And, and so my sister, who doesn't normally video people, videoed her laughing her head off. She's oh, just wow. laughing and laughing and having a great time. And that is one of my most favorite, precious videos of her. Yeah. So, oh, that's beautiful. I love that. And your uncle was particular. You were particularly close to your uncle, weren't you? I loved my uncle Greg. I loved him so much. He, him and my dad were, they just, they bounced off each other so well. And my uncle treated me like his daughter even more so than he should have because he just loved me and my brother so much. And my uncle, I think one of my favorite memories of my uncle was he, he lived in new Orleans. So he had this beautiful house right on the bayou and he kind of did the same thing my dad did. He was a jokester. He was charming. He was funny, but he, <laughs> I guess you can get f like fake crabs <laughs> that that look like can real you? crabs. <laughs> I I don't I don't know. Maybe he had them laying around, but he you know since he lived on the water, he always had fish. He had crab traps and stuff like that. And he one time he picked up a crab trap and one of them got loose. And he picked it up and he threw it at me and my brother and my brother just squealed and it was a fake crab. And it was the it was just so <laughs> funny because we were like seven or eight at this time. So we were, you know, we were like, oh, my God, what is the crab doing here? <laughs> and it was it, yeah. it's, it was, you know, he was just like my dad. And I loved it. I loved it so much. <laughs> Good. And your grandma, the beautiful, loving head of your family. Mm. My my grandmother was so soft. She was she was a wonderful woman and she was very crafty. And 
this probably isn't the greatest memory to share, but it was one of, <laughs> it was one of my, I just highlights of our relationship. We went thrift shopping together and I always loved it because she always found some really interesting handcrafted things when I found clothes and other accessories and stuff. But we were driving in New Orleans because she lived in New Orleans as well. And we were just chatting along, listening to some Beach Boys and, you know, some old music. And she just runs a red light in the middle of the light. And, you know, I'm like, I'm looking both ways and no one got hurt. Nothing happened. But she just pretended like nothing happened. And so did I. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, okay, I'm not going to tell my dad about this. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And, you know, you're beautiful, mom. There's so many things about my mom that I wish I could share with you, but it would take the rest of the day up until about 11 p.m. our original time. (laughs) But I will shorten it up to one sweet moment when her and I were sitting in the living room and she also loved music and she loved the Bee Gees and we were listening to one of their songs and we started dancing together and we were both singing to each other. I'm trying to think of the name of the song, but it was, it was so beautiful because it was one of her favorite songs and it was one of my favorite melodies. And I just remember singing there, singing with her and dancing with her. And I, will always hold that very close to my heart because it just makes me feel warm. And I know that she, I can hear her sometimes still sing to me. And I just, it just brings me so much warmth. (laughs) Oh, gosh, beautiful. I love it. I love those memories. And Mm -hmm. I love just, I can just feel the love and warmth and everything just coming straight out of you. It's, it's, you know, as you, as you remembered them and remembered those moments. And that's what it's all about, I think, just finding those beautiful, beautiful memories and mm. moments. Mm-hmm. Now, between all of your family members, your grief actually covers so many different types from cancer to an unexpected overdose to a suicide to just natural causes, you know, like right across the board. (laughs) Is that where your anxiety and depression and PTSD started to come from? Was all the different types you were going through or how did that start manifesting for you? So I had always been an anxious child. I, I don't know what really caused my anxiety. I do know later on what caused it because it was, everything was completely out of my control. And, but I suffered heavily when I was a child and I slowly started becoming friends with my anxiety. And when I mean friends is that I started understanding, I started listening, I started talking to my anxiety and trying to figure out root causes of what could be you know, bringing on these anxiety attacks. And it came to be that there's just so many things that are out of my control that I wanted to be control of, but I couldn't, I just couldn't. And when I started, when I lost my dad, the anxiety after that was for my brother. I was very worried about my brother and for very obvious reasons. (laughs) And when I lost my brother, my anxiety kind of subsided a little bit because I had no idea what I was about to endure four months later. So after that, I kind of always expected the unexpected and just kind of rolled with it and kind of understood that there's big things to worry about and there's little things to worry about. And the big things, if there's nothing I can do in that moment to fix them, then I cannot worry about them. And that was really hard. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I can just only imagine. But that's a huge insight and awareness for somebody so, so young. 
And I'm so pleased that I'm not pleased that you had to go through all of those experiences to understand it or to learn it, but to actually have that understanding within yourself that you can heal yourself from within is huge because you've got the rest of your life ahead of you still. And many, many people are not going to learn that until much, much later in life like I had to. You know, I had to enjoy years of being a perfectionist and, you know, <laughs> setting these unrealistic ideals on myself before I realized I had to let that go and that I couldn't control things like you. I was doing it in another way, rather through, I guess it was a bit of anxiety, but it was just perfectionism, trying to have yes. everything perfect and controlled. Yeah, and absolutely. And, yeah, and then, of course, yeah. Then when you start to lose people, you realize this is just going to happen. It's like, oh, there's <laughs> like, nothing I can do here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I've got absolutely no control. And there is, like now, when I look at you and I listen to you and I even sense a beautiful calm about you and a peace within you. So that's, I think that's really special. Oh, well, it's, you know, I, I didn't grow up with, a health insurance and even if I did the our mental health system is not great so yeah. having to figure out how to maneuver life without the aid of medicine or therapy you know you you figure some things out you figure it out and now that yeah. I'm able to provide those things for myself I've learned that I've done an okay job. <laughs> so it's it's really more than just okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> well thank you. It, it's more of just having these conversations and really understanding where where they're coming from. And if you can't understand that, then you can't fix it. And if you can't fix it, then you can't heal. And healing is a choice. And I was ready yeah. to heal. <laughs> Yes, yes, and I think that's why we are here, why we go through the experiences we do, because, you know, to learn from them and to recognize what they're all about and to heal from them, like you say. So were those the main steps that you took to get yourself back in the game again, to be able to to cope with just grief after grief after grief after grief, or what else factored into that? My ultimate healing was after my mom passed away. I was I graduated college. I was in my field of study. I was starting my career. And then my mom passed away and my brain just stopped working. Uh, I was working in the yeah. music industry and it's very fast paced and I loved it. It was it yeah. was great. It's what I always wanted, but a fast paced grief brain didn't work. So the best thing for me to do was to leave. And this was really hard. This was really hard to to do because I had worked so hard to get to where I was. But yeah. I knew that I didn't want to ruin my reputation. And that's really, that sounds really bad. But in the music industry, it's really close. It's all about who knows you. And I wanted to save face. And so I left gracefully and I spent about four months just grieving. And what yeah. I mean by that is really allowing myself to feel the uncomfortable emotions, the painful emotions, the kicking, the screaming, the crying, the, the you know, lightheadedness from not remembering to breathe. Like I felt that for four months and then I was like, okay, I took a deep breath one day and was like, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing to fulfill my purpose in life? And I realized that my purpose in life was to, to tell my story and to help other people. And so that's when I started my podcast. And yeah. that is what I feel helped me grieve and help me get to this point where I was able to be there for other people was allowing myself to take that time and really have those hard emotions or really like really allowing myself to grieve that really helped me get to where I am today 
It's so funny because when I listen to you talk, it's like you're actually telling my own story. <laughs> because, you know, I walked away from my career that I'd spent, you know, a number of years building up when I was, you know, like at that tipping point where, yeah. you know, finally <laughs> I was going to be in a position, you know, where I could be making some pretty decent money and, mm -hmm. you know, setting myself up well and, and doing all that. But, you know, what I think a lot of people don't understand is the huge impact that that grief brain has on you because it's <laughs> like being stuffed, having your brain. For me, it was like having my brain stuffed with cotton wool and everything took me twice as long, three times as long to do because I would always be double checking myself and then there were some things that I did that I went did I really do that did I do that <laughs> why did I do that and yeah. I you know I had no recollection and that brain fog or however you want to describe it has a huge impact doesn't it 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 you know a lot of people don't understand that when I told them that my brain just stopped working they look at me like their brain yeah. just stopped working. <laughs> and I'm like, it's it's a real thing. It's a real thing. When you yeah. have gone through so much trauma, your brain loses a lot of its functions because of the trauma that has that's been endured. And I think that's something that a lot of people wouldn't understand till later in life. And for because my boss, when I left, didn't understand. And I was doing yeah. the same thing that you were doing. I was triple checking my work and I was still making mistakes and you know I was like I can't I can't keep doing this it's not good you know I, I there's someone's yeah. brand their reputations on the line I can't keep yeah. I can't I can't do it <laughs> I have to I have to grieve yeah, yeah. And I'm so pleased that you did that. Just taking that time to allow yourself to cry, to not breathe, <laughs> to, yeah. to sleep as late as you wanted to, yeah. to do all of those things is allowing your body to actually feel what it needs to feel and to release them. And that what I did is I actually very quickly after I lost my girl, I had to go back to work. I didn't mm. have that time out. And so I repressed it <laughs> and I just yeah. went, I just threw myself back into work and worked, 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 worked. But it comes out and it <laughs> comes out when you least expect it or least want it to come out. <laughs> yes, it does. You know, when you're at something and some, some, a song <laughs> plays or somebody says something and then suddenly you're this like, sobbing mess on the ground. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I I went back to work after two weeks, and then I stay. I went, I stayed for about two more weeks, and then I was like, I can't. Yeah. So I come. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but you know, there's nothing ever lost in this world. So all that experience and all that study you've done will come back in a beautiful way to support you so you know it's not like you've lost a career or whatever it'll just come in a different way so Absolutely. hold on to that <laughs> how did you carry on with your schooling through all of these losses how did you even study <laughs> oh I forget so I forget college so much <laughs> and that's another thing when yeah. you go through trauma you forget things and yes. <laughs> I I graduated in 20, March, no, May of 2020. So it was right when the pandemic hit. And throughout that, I used my schooling to distract me. And it worked really well. <laughs> I yeah. can't lie. It worked great. Uh, but I knew when I started getting close to my graduation date, I was like, oh, boy, I'm going to need some therapy because I can no longer use school as a distraction once I graduate. Unless I go back to school and I was like, you know what, Jesse, you don't hate yourself that much. <laughs> so <laughs> like, like, let's just <laughs> let's not do that again. So I, I knew that I needed to kind of have a backup plan. And my backup plan was to 
well, it was to get therapy, but it's really hard. It's really hard to find a good therapist yeah. that will work with you, yeah. that you can afford, one that you know that you want to, you look forward to work with. Yeah. yeah, and so I unfortunately didn't get a therapist until after my mom passed away. But I did focus a lot on my mom when I graduated college. I loved it. I loved that I did it. Because it brought a lot of wonderful memories, but it, you know, it was a short term solution. It wasn't a a full, a long term solution. So it was, uh, school was a great way to suppress your feelings. (laughs) Don't recommend (laughs) at all. (laughs) I've been reading and listening to an audio book by Bessel van der Kolk, who deals a lot with PTSD. And he was mentioning some of the best remedies for people with significant PTSD has been not talking, not the the typical grief therapy, but it's been through things like meditation and yoga and dance and Mm -hmm. you know those non-traditional things that we kind of don't associate with dealing with our grief and that's been a huge insight for me because you know I know a lot of people just don't want to go and tell their story again and again and especially if they don't have the right person Right, And sometimes when you're talking about it, it's just reliving it all and you don't want to do that. Yet there are other ways we can release our emotions and those repressed feelings we have within us. And Mm -hmm. I really like that research that's coming out. So I'm hoping that therapy is, is moving a lot more into those sort of realms than just sitting down in front of somebody talking. (laughs) Yes, that's what we can hope for. I mean, it's it's unfair that it's so hard to seek help when you're almost at your lowest. It's it was yeah. I just remember that it was 2 weeks after my mom had passed that I had the social worker who worked on with my mom. I had her help. So I had 2 weeks to find somebody that I could work with. And no one, because of the pandemic, no one was really accepting new patients. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I don't want to do this on my own. (laughs) I can't do this on my own. I need help. And I finally found somebody who was like, can you can we have a conversation before you book with me? And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yes, (laughs) please. I will literally do anything. (laughs) good I'm glad you found that person and that's what it's like trying to navigate when you can't even think yourself oh my goodness me yeah (laughs) so what failures because you talk about this really openly and honestly you talk about having triumphs and failures and everything in between in your journey so what do you consider some of the failures that actually you've probably turned into triumphs and learned from (laughs) So it started when my dad passed away, one of my biggest failures. And I want to just say for the record, failures are a wonderful way of growing. And I embrace my failures because it has brought me to this point. And in order to succeed, you have to fail. And so for, for those who may need help, failing is not always the worst thing that can happen to you. And my first failure was turning to alcohol as a way to cope. And I failed miserably at that. And I lost a lot of friends and lost my boyfriend. I didn't care. I just lost my dad. I was like, you just, you don't understand me. And I didn't understand yeah. what I was going through. I just used that as an excuse to do what I wanted to do. And that's not fair. So that was a huge failure for me. And I think, you know, Helen, I think my biggest failure was never acknowledging the fact that my brother was an addict. I never acknowledged that. And you can never fix and you can never help what you can't acknowledge. And I never wanted to believe that he was an addict. And I have to tell you, it. I just 
had this realization probably about two days ago that my brother was an addict and it didn't change how I, how I view him. I love him dearly. He is still my brother, but he was an addict. And if I would have acknowledged that when he was around, I maybe could have helped a little bit more, but I ignored it. I ignored it. And in the end, that doesn't help anybody. So I think my biggest failure was not acknowledging the facts that were presented to me. Wow, thank you for sharing that because that is such a hugely personal, personal thing to share. And especially about your brother who you just dearly love. I know you do. I just can see, you know, and feel all that love. But do you know what I think? You know, we're all given trials in our life, things that Mm -hmm. we need to overcome. And I think the more that we understand that addiction is just another form of of what people go through in order for them to actually realize that there's some really deep stuff that they need to work through and feel safe with and be able to get through. And there are so many people out there enduring that at the moment. And I just want to change the whole stigma around that whole addiction thing because it is so prevalent. There's so many people and they are not bad people. People Mm -hmm. who are addicted to substances or whatever, whether it be work, sex, substances, alcohol, whatever. Yes. They are not bad people. They are Mm -hmm. just people with a lot of feelings, thoughts, emotions, probably deeply, deeply suppressed that they may not even be aware of. And so they're just... You know, living in that moment of how they can fix the way they feel. Absolutely. I'm excited to hope that there are some really good people out there trying to highlight that we need to think about this differently, that Mm -hmm. we need to think about mental health differently. Yes. In whatever form it takes. I think now is our time to start looking at how we can support people and make them feel safe and secure. Because that's what it's about. When you feel safe, secure, then you can start looking at what what, what you fear, what those demons Absolutely. are. So. Absolutely. Beautifully wow. said. <laughs> wow. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to get on a bit of a rant. Oh, I love it. It was beautiful. It was absolutely, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> oh, thanks. Hey, Jesse, when people endure major trauma or life events like you have, And as you alluded to, they often let go of their old life as it makes no sense anymore. And you gave up your job to start your podcast. So what was it that actually led to you starting a podcast? Because, you know, this is the same thing I did. (laughs) I just felt this need to use my voice and I didn't know why, but I understand why now as I've been going through this journey. What was that like for you? Oh man, when I started the podcast, I well, my my idea was how do I get a small message to a large audience of people without having to show my face? Cuz my face is even though you can see me, my face can really misconstrue like misconstrue what I'm trying to say cuz I can sit here and tell you you're like, "Oh, I'm happy." Yay. And, yeah. you know, my face, it doesn't say that. So I was like, how do yeah. I get my message to a large audience of people? And I was like, well, college, I had to take a class on audio production. And I was like, well, why don't I just go ahead and use some of the knowledge that I paid for to kind of help me get this message out? And so I started the podcast, but it wasn't until, this might sound crazy, but I met with a medium. And before I like before I go into the story, when you're grieving, anything that makes you feel good, <laughs> you hold on to it. <laughs> you hold on to it. Absolutely. And when I went to this medium, she was just spot on with my dad and my brother. And when she told me that my dad told me that my purpose was to help other people, I thought to myself one day after sleeping in till one, two o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, what am I doing right now to help people? 
I was told, I was blessed enough to be told what my purpose was and what am I doing to fulfill that? Absolutely nothing. So that's when I started the podcast and I have kept that purpose through the hard times because one of the hardest things that I had to overcome was talking about my story because putting my story into a timeline, into a series of mm, unfortunate events really made it real. And that was very difficult for, for me to understand, to, to read the fact that I had lost so many people in only seven years was a really hard pill for me to swallow. And once I got over that, that hump, I was like, all right, let's do this. And when I started it, I'm not sure if this happened to you, but I'm almost positive it could probably happen to you because you are one of the top podcasters when it comes to grief. I got really overwhelmed from the response that I got to where I had to take a step back from the podcast. I was like, I was not equipped nor ready for people to rely on me for answers and for support when I'm still grieving myself. So I had to take a step back, but I came back strong and here I am right here with you talking to you about grief. And that's all I could ask for. (laughs) Well done, Jesse. Do you know, so I've only hit the milestone of having my podcast up and running in March. But of course, March is when I lost my daughter. Oh, wow. And as I mentioned to you, it came up to a five-year anniversary. But I'd sort of started another job and and I just had all this pressure on me. I felt all this pressure on me. And and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to sit with myself for the next month. And I'm just going to allow myself to feel, adjust to my new situation. Because when I do this podcast, the most important thing for me is to honor the stories that people are sharing. Mm -hmm. That is my number one. And I felt I couldn't do that when I was a bit of a mess. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so, yes, and so I did. I allowed myself to step back. And a month is a long time in the podcasting world because I've just worked up all this momentum and then I go and do nothing for a month. And I went, all right, I'm just going to trust the universe on this. And do you know what? The universe has delivered because I checked my stats and in that month that I didn't do anything, I've had more downloads than any other yes, yes. And I was going, holy heck. <laughs> <laughs> and so, again, it just reaffirms that when you're feeling that, you just need to honor that and 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 just, you know, it, stop, stop, get off the bus for a moment mm-hmm. and just take stock of where you are and then you're more than ready to come back into it. Like I am loving loving being back in interviewing mm-hmm. people it's my passion do you think that this whole process has made you a more authentic jesse i do i do because my first season i was very timid on who i was and what i wanted to to show everybody and This might come to a shock to you, Ellen, but I have a horrible potty mouth. (laughs) (laughs) I have, and that was that was something that came from both sides of the family. So (laughs) I just got a double whammy. But one of the hardest things for me was to allow myself to be authentic and to not cut out the curse words or the ums or the uhs. And the awkward pauses, because that's what it, that's what it is. You know, when you're sitting here in front of a mic all day, you're 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 making mistakes, and you're not talking to anybody, and you're just down here talking to yourself. And you know, people people want that. They want to. They don't want to listen to 
an audio book. They want to listen to a real person. And yeah. I think that was a really hard pill for me to swallow because I wanted to be perfect. Yeah, I know. For me, I'd never allowed, like all growing up, I was the person that never allowed people to take photographs of me. I never put myself out there. I never liked the way I looked. And so what? I would never. So to actually put myself on a camera and let people <laughs> see me <laughs> was huge. And then I just got to this stage where I just think, ah, whatever, you know, none of us are perfect. And and for me, the people I most love, I just see that inner beauty. So, uh, you know, I just think, oh, well, this is who I am. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what you've got. <laughs> right. And I hope it's my message that people are listening to and getting, you know, value from rather than anything else. So so let's let's talk about... What else you've discovered in yourself and sitting with your grief and why you are so passionate about living the life that was denied to others that you've lost so early? So that one was really hard for me to understand. You know, I never really understood why someone who was called shy, timid, sensitive was the last remaining member of my family like why why wasn't it you know my brother who was you know boisterous who was ready to go for anything and I was the one that got chosen to live like I I was very confused but I embraced it I was like all right onward let's figure this out and super cake (laughs) (laughs) exactly I was like all right you know straighten up the tie and let's go and I, it came to my, my brother's birthday. It was his 28th birthday. So his last, his last birthday that he had. And he passed away when he was 22. So it's been a while. But I sat there and I had my moment and was like, there is no way. And this is so cliche and everyone says it. But really understanding it is the difference. There is no way that my brother would want me crying next to his headstone. Yeah. And everyone told me that. They're like, they, didn't, they wouldn't want you sad. And it's like, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Where it's like, oh, they're in a better place. Like, I get it. I understand. But until you fully wrap your head around that concept, it's like, yeah. okay. And, and then you ask yourself, or ask the universe, what would they want me to do? If they don't want me crying, what do they want me to do? They want you to live. And because they live through you. And they live through every experience that you get to do. And they're, they, they love that. And I've learned that through, you know, validation of things that have happened to me. Like... With my dad, there's like a certain song that plays. And every time that I'm doing something, because I always have music going around in my house or whatever. Anytime I'm like doing something, I'm cooking because he was a chef in something like I flip an egg <laughs> and the song comes <laughs> on. I'm like, OK, like, you know, I it's one of those moments where I'm like, you know what? I'm actually happy to be alive. And I think the coolest part about being the last remaining member of my family is now I get to create my own physical family and and my support system. And in some ways, it's stronger than what I had before. And I think that it has given me a whole new purpose than to, you know, because I still have my dad and my brother and my mom and my uncle, and I still have everybody But when I, you know, when I'm crying and I want to call somebody, I have multiple people that will answer except, you know, except for the people who aren't here. And I think it's helped me a lot to kind of figure out who I want to be without having people kind of directing me how I should live. It's how I want to live. And I get to live such an exciting life now 
because yeah. I can take everyone with me instead of like, oh, I wish you were here. It's like, no, they are here. And the, every yeah. experience I get to experience, they're here with me. And it's it's so it's so hard and sad <laughs> to say it out loud, but living it and breathing it and believing in it has been a saving grace for me. That is so beautifully said, Jesse. Really, I could feel I could feel everything in what you were saying. And to my girl, she was going, no, no way, are you going to feel sorry for yourself? And, yeah. <laughs> and so she would let me cry for about a minute or so, and then she'd call me a dork or something like that, you know, because <laughs> I hear her. And and I've heard her right from the get-go, and and that's what makes me laugh. And I'm going, God, you won't even let me cry. I know. <laughs> She's going, no. <laughs> and I love yes, it. Yes, <laughs> and I and, you know, and I, I love what you said about being able to create the life that's right for you, that you need to be living, that is your purpose. And that's that's why I just love what I do and I honor what I do and I value what I do because I think this is just all the stepping stones to something bigger than what I know. And it's mm-hmm. all coming from my beautiful loved ones who have passed over, who watch over me, who guide me, who, you know, kick me in the butt when I need kicking in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked you talked about having a beautiful support system around you now. Tell us about that. How did that happen? Did you have to go looking for it or has it just organically built itself up? How, how has that happened for you? It is. It has been organically erupted because... I, when I, when my mom was, let's see, where can I start here? (laughs) Because it happened very quickly and very unexpectedly. But when I started, one of the biggest problems, okay, all right, all right. (laughs) One of the biggest problems that I had when I lost my dad was not telling anybody about my dad being sick. I have had a friend since she was four and I was five. And I told her two weeks before he passed away that he was sick and it was too late. It was way too late to be telling people that, you know, something like this is going on. And so I never made that mistake again, but when my mom, (laughs) and you can only imagine how I felt, but having to tell people like, my mom's dying. It was almost embarrassing because it had, it had it was just it just kept happening. So yeah, uh, I know we're laughing, but it's not funny. Yeah, but. you know that I felt I felt silly because I was like, you know, I had come to people about my brother, and I came to people about my uncle, and then my grandma, and then you know my dogs, and you know my must not even get into pets. But when my mom was getting very ill that's i reached out to only a select number of people and kind of told them like hey mom's dying just thought i'd let you know and only a certain amount of people stepped up and i never asked them to nor did i really want them to because how how (laughs) how does someone at the age of 25 who are just focusing on getting married or having kids or starting a family or buying a house, how can they understand and be able to be there for me when they're trying to start their own life? And I was really surprised. I was really surprised that I had, you know, my friend Rachel, my friend Haley. I have my friend Keenan who was like, every Wednesday, we're going to have dinner. And there has only been two Wednesdays since my mom died that we've missed. Every Wednesday, Uh we're usually together. And those Wednesdays, we're either really sick with COVID or we're out of town. (laughs) So, yeah. And then, of course, my aunt and uncle, who is on my mom's side, they, you know, I see them every Friday. That was another thing that kind of, they kind of stepped up and was like, let's get together every Friday. Let's do something fun. Let's, you know, and I I love that. And it's also a routine that I've built. And I I just love my support system so much. And 
it's so different because they are allowing me to discover who I am without passing judgment. And I think it's lovely. I think it's lovely. And I think everyone should be able to have and build their own support system for people who are ready to be there for you. And I just, I'm so thankful for it. And don't wait until you're losing people to do that either, eh, right. Jesse? Just yes. do it now. You know, reach out because people are just waiting for you to say something. You know, right. they're waiting yeah. out there to help. And but you have to t- make that first step. Take that first step yeah. and say, "Hey, I'm not doing so great." You know, in this game of life, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, give me a helping hand, and that is something I dearly, dearly wish that I had known much, much earlier in my life. And, yeah, well, I'm so, so happy that you've got that beautiful support wrapped around you, (laughs) Jesse. We spoke earlier, and I wished we'd had been recording our earlier (laughs) conversation when we first talked up because we were talking about what it is millennials need you know, to get from grieving and to learn uh, or just to assist them with that whole grief process and and just the younger generation, because I believe it is different from my generation and even that generation that's older from me. So, So what do you think it is people your own age are looking for, are needing, are wanting? And it doesn't have to be grief from losing somebody it can be grief of the loss of a relationship or Mm -hmm. not getting the job you wanted or losing the job that you loved in this time of the pandemic Mm -hmm. grief of any description what do you think it is younger people are wanting and needing we just want to be heard (laughs) that that's the biggest thing but the the thing that we don't understand is how to convey the fact that we need help and how to start the conversation of getting help or even allowing ourselves to start the grieving process is having someone that we feel safe with that we know that can understand where we're coming from or someone who will actually acknowledge the the pain and the struggles that we're going through and once we feel, once we get those check boxes marked, we're able to kind of figure out where we want to go, but we still need someone to assist us, like you said, in starting the conversation within ourselves. And us millennials, we have such a hard time because we are fed these picture perfect you know, yeah. things on social media to where we are supposed to be unlimitedly happy and life is not happy all the time living is not happy all the time and for for us to acknowledge that and understand that is hard because happiness is something that we all want to achieve but it's not something we can all have and it is really frustrating for someone (laughs) you know, who is a millennial, who wants to start the conversation, who I feel like I am quite qualified to talk (laughs) about grief and loss. I'd say so. (laughs) You know, I'm not tooting my own horn over here, but I, you know, I'd like to think that I know a little bit about it, but them not knowing how to talk about it because it's not something that is taught you know we're able to you know back in elementary school or middle school we were given these writing prompts of you tell us a happy memory that we had eating ice cream or you know tell us about a time where you know you had such and such experience but it's never those conversations where it's like tell me about a time where you really felt depressed And we have no idea how to talk about these things. And therapy helps, but like we discussed in the beginning, can't always get it. So it's just having these allies who are able to assist and provide a safe place 
you know, safe place, air quotes, for for people to talk about these things. And it's not even about having the information to fix it. It's more just about having a space to be able to speak. And so you're heard, Mm -hmm. isn't it? So that it's not about people making it right or wrong, because some things you can never make right again. Right. You can make the best of them, but you can't make them right again. So is it because I feel like some people feel like, oh, I have to pri- provide them with a solution or some advice or some, uh, you know, upbeat comment to help them feel happier or cope better. It's not about that at all, though, is it? Mm-mm. It's it's about being heard and being understood when we don't know how to start the conversation. <laughs> It is really tough. It's really hard. It's really tough out here for a millennial when it comes to grief because our communication skills, not great. (laughs) I'll be the first to admit it. Not great. (laughs) Ironically, because social media has given you, you know, millennials a platform to be more articulate, more communicative. But, you know, that's just not happening. I think it happens for a small, small percentage of people. Mm -hmm. And that's where our misconception comes from, that we sort of tar everybody with the same brush, that all millennials can and do and are. And, you know, but that's not the case at all. There's an awful lot of people just sitting in the background there that don't feel they know how to articulate what they need to say about how they're feeling yeah yeah it's 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 you know there's always the outliers the outliers I'm one of them you know there's people who reach out to me you know on Facebook messenger or on Instagram you know those are outliers but (laughs) I can tell you out of my friend group or the people that I went to high school with who have endured loss, one person has reached out to me. One. Wow. And I know that they're not afraid to reach out to me. It's just they don't know how. They don't know how to So how do we make it better? How do we make that better for them to do that? And how can somebody like me support this process? I, th- I believe the, the way we get them to start is to straight up acknowledge what they've gone through and to make them feel uncomfortable because growth happens when you start feeling uncomfortable and have them explore the feelings and the emotions that they have been hiding for so long. And I think what we're doing here with the podcast and talking, just starting this conversation is a great first step in allowing someone to feel a little bit more comfortable talking about things like this, because, you know, it's unfortunately our culture, we weren't taught about death. We were, you know, taught about getting married, having kids, you know, buying a house, starting a career, but we were never talked, we were never taught about, death and unfortunately there is a i always tell everyone this there's a 100 percent chance that you're going to lose somebody you love in your life yes why why aren't we talking yeah, about how to handle that i think that's a really important point that you've just brought up for everybody to understand why is it we don't talk about death it's just this like almost like there's still a taboo subject or a taboo feeling around it that people don't sort their wills out they don't tell people how they'd like their end of life to look like whether they want a celebration of life or a funeral or we just are not having those really healthy conversations which would make it more acceptable and I think Everybody across the board needs to perhaps be more open to doing this. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's unfair that our society has set us up for failure when it comes to these things. I, I think it's completely, I think it's trash. <laughs> I think it's absolute trash yeah. that we don't talk about it. Because if I would have known that, like, there's always a possibility that you know you're going to lose your 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 family or your 
your dad or your mom because they're older. You know, you, you're kind of, uh, it's an understood thing. But what about those unexpected losses that you weren't prepared for? Why, yeah. why, what is out there? What resources are out there to really, to really help us besides what we're doing? And what we're doing yeah. is huge. And I'm definitely in no way selling us short. But it, in elementary school, middle school, like what are what are we doing? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what yeah. what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's this, there's this project I want to get involved in called, you know, Red Chocolate Elephants. And it's about, it's a resource that supports families around suicide. And in oh. particular, it's children talking about and asking questions and sharing their thoughts about their their father or their mother or their brother or whoever they've lost. And it's a beautiful, beautiful resource. And I want to get involved in that. So that's going to be my mission later this this year to finally it. get some traction with that. That goes to frontline people like the police and 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 the the fire service and the ambulance service and in schools for teachers and you know those people that need to be having access to this beautiful resource. And I think we just need to just be stop sitting on our backsides and just be bold and brave if we've got a good idea and go for it and it doesn't matter whether people agree with it or not it's the fact that we get up there and try and do something absolutely yeah absolutely jesse okay we're gonna wrap it up now girl <laughs> we've had this <laughs> amazing talk what is the best thing that's happened to you so far today and i know what it is ah so today is the official homecoming of the diamond that I had my mom's. Most people use their ashes, but I did not get my mom's ashes, but I had some of her hair, but I had my mom turned into a diamond and I got the diamond set into a ring. And today is the day that I got my ring after a year and a, f a year and a month. It took 13 months for this to happen, and today is the official day that I got my diamond ring, and I am just over the moon to be sharing this with you. I am so, so happy for you, and a massive congratulations because- <laughs> Thank you, you know, so much. That is something so special that's going to be on your finger. I can see it. You've been like, ah. listeners, you can't see it, but it is beautiful, and it's a beautiful blue color, and oh, so mm. precious, so precious. All righty. So what is your proudest moment to date in your life so far? The proudest moment- is getting out of bed, getting behind a microphone, pressing record, and starting my journey with sharing my story. And it was, I tell you the exact date it was, it was July 14th, 2021, when I sat there and pressed record, and I sat there and told my story. Yes, it did take me a while and a couple, a couple trial and errors, but that was my biggest accomplishment ever was starting this journey of, of sharing my story. I'm so very proud of you, Jesse. And I'm very, <laughs> I'm very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your go-to when you have those dark moments intrude on your day and you feel like everything's looking a little bit dark? How do you pivot yourself out, out of that moment? I... For, I take a deep breath and acknowledge the feelings and sometimes I can't overcome them and that's okay. And I allow myself to have grace and forgiveness and to start a new day tomorrow. And because someone out there is always counting on you to break through somehow. So that's, that's what keeps me going. <laughs> that's so, so beautiful. Well done, you. Right. What takeaways would you like to leave our listeners with? The biggest takeaway for anyone listening is to allow yourself to live the life that was denied to others on anniversaries. Do something that you want to do. And, and if it's something that's in memory of them, absolutely go for it. And 
like I just said, someone out there is counting on you to break through somehow. And you have the strength within to do it. You just have to sit there and make yourself uncomfortable. And one of the biggest things that I've learned is healing is a choice. And whenever you're ready to make that choice, make sure you have a good, strong support system with you. And I, I love, I love being able to share those key points with everybody. Jesse, you don't know how I'm feeling right now because you just remind me of my beautiful girl <laughs> oh. sitting there in front of me, and oh. she, she would be like you. She would be going for gold uh, despite what had happened to her, and she'd be picking herself up dusting herself off and going for it like you have and I feel like so privileged that you chose to to speak to me and and share your thoughts share your journey share your losses and share the voice of this beautiful younger generation and Jesse I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that Oh, well, I can't thank you enough. It's It's been an absolute pleasure and honor to be here. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some real value from this episode. Let me know how I'm doing or if there's a topic you'd like covered by clicking on the Healing To Be You Gmail link or going to the Healing To Be You website. To get notified of new episodes, hit the subscribe button and please share, share, share if you know of someone who could benefit from this episode. Until next time, be kind to you and take good care.